Thank you, everybody, for turning up to this, the first of our collaboration between Arts Hub and the Arts Centre's channel. So we're delighted to be here, Richard and I. And just quickly, so before we begin in earnest about writing insightful reviews, I just want to do a quick introduction um, so you know who I am. My name is Tuyan. I am the reviews editor of Arts Hub, and I've done this job for probably the last two and a half years. And before that, I was a freelance writer and I wrote many things and many reviews for a bunch of publications. So I wrote book reviews for the mainstream papers like The Age and The Australian, Saturday Paper, The Guardian, Sydney Review of Books, um, Australian Book Review, and I was books editor of The Big Issue for about eight years. I also had a stint as the Melbourne theatre correspondent for The Australian. So I'm either writing reviews or editing them. And my job at Arts Hub is basically commissioning, editing and publishing reviews of the free art forms that we specialise in, which are books, uh, live performance and exhibitions. So I'm just going to push it to Richard now to just do a quick introduction of himself. Thanks, Tweet. Uh, good evening. Um, my name's Richard Watts. I'm the performing arts editor of Arts Hub. Uh, I was born on Jarja Wurrung country, grew up on Gurnai Kurnai country, and have the privilege of living on Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung country in Fitzroy today. Um, uh, for anybody who's, uh, who needs uh, a visual description or is streaming this uh, and listening, uh, I am a middle-aged, mm -hmm. overweight, cisgendered white man with grey hair and a grey beard that badly need a trim. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also slightly sunburnt. Um, and I'm wearing black because that's what I wear because I work in the arts in Melbourne. I'm sure there's a law about it. It's a uniform. It's a Melbourne uniform of the arts. Yeah. So um, I have worked at Arts Hub uh, for 14 years. I'm now rusted on. Um, in which time I've done about four different roles. I was the reviews editor at one point. Um, I been a f kind of a, a features writer, writing <coughs> kind of just profiles and soft news. Then I did hard news journalism for a while, and now I'm the national performing arts editor. Uh, covering the entire country um, and its performing arts scene can be a challenge, but it's fun. So Thanks, thank Richard. you all for coming. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk about the structure of this talk today. So Rich and I are going to talk generally about writing reviews before we specialise. So I'm going to talk a lot about book reviewing, Richard will talk about live performance reviewing and because Gina Fairley, our visual arts um, editor, is not here because she's based in New South Wales, she's given me a bullet point of what to do when you're trying to write a visual arts review. So I'm going to read that out in the end. Um, we're going to talk for about 45 minutes. So please, if you have any questions about anything, um, please wait till then. And Rich and I will also hang out a bit afterwards. So if you want to talk to either of us about anything, we'll still be available to talk. All right, so let's get back to business. What makes an insightful review? All right, Rich and I had a bit of brainstorming session and we had to, and Richard decided we had to put the word insightful because you can't just write what makes a good review because, you know, insightful is a, quite a meaningful word. And for me, it's like, if you write a review, for me, to, to really love it, it has to be interesting. And that just means that it is an art form in its own right, okay? It's not something you should just whip off flippantly. It kind of takes a great skill set to do well. And contrary to popular belief, it's not just about a value judgment. For me, it's really about context. And you have to build your arguments about whether, uh, you know, you enjoyed a particular art form or it disappointed you. And the really the question you have to ask yourself is why? That is the most important thing about a review, why? Um, because the responsibility is towards the artist, of course, but also towards the audience. So you have to try and be fair. Now, you think of a review as a persuasive piece of writing. It sounds quite grandiose, but think of it, it doesn't matter how long it is, but you're taking the reader on a journey. And for me, it's like, it's your responsibility to point out the sites and also the potholes as you go along. So you're kind of like the bridge between the art form and the reader. Um, 
and here's, here's another analogy, if you like analogies. For me, it's like the reviewers acts as a drawbridge between intention and result. And what I mean by that is like, did they kind of succeed in what they tried to do? And if they didn't, why? Um, Richard, do you want to just break in and say other yeah, stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, for me, one of the key things to think about when writing a piece of criticism, regardless of whether you call it a review or a, or a critique, uh, something that was said to me years ago by a former arts edit editor of the age is that um, your job as a reviewer slash critic is not to say whether you thought something was good or bad. That's the conversation you have with, with friends. Your job is to identify what works or what does not work about a particular artwork. Are there elements of it which are jarring, uh, which seem tonally... Um, at odds or at war with other as aspects of, in my case, the performing arts. So to use a, um, a, an example, is the sound design subtle, immersive, um, helping tell the story that the director is taking you on and the cast are taking you, you on? Or is it intrusive, jarring, perhaps at times inappropriate? Thinking about those kind of details. Um, and identifying them in the review you write are a key part of a reviewer's job. I like to think of review writing as n not being unlike writing an essay. You have to... You need a structure, you need a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, you need to craft a persuasive argument as to why the points you're raising are significant. Um, so, in terms of, again, thinking about the structure of a review, one rule of thumb I sometimes give to people is, say, in, for the first quarter of your review, if you're writing, say, a 600-word review, tell us about what the show looked like and felt like. Um, kind of an opening line that will hook the reader in immediately, saying, I don't know, from um, uh, a forest of fog, a, a figure emerges like um, a witch at dawn or something like that. Um, use that kind of evocative prose to hook the reader in from the start, because as Twee said, a review is like any other piece of writing. It needs to be a beautifully crafted piece of writing, mm -hmm. and it needs to capture somebody's attention. And also, yeah, it's also news reporting in a way in case it has to be factual. Um, people forget that. Mm. that you have to, yeah, sure, you'd be emotive and lyrical, but that's not really good if you kind of stuff up people's names because you're too busy being lyrical and poetic. Remember, it's like in news reporting, in fact, you have to try and be as fair as possible, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Fact-checking, very important. Microphone technique, also very important. Hold the mic closer. Um, you can tell I'm a radio broadcaster. Um, uh, but one of the things that um, I was about to say in terms of the structure, yeah, use that introduction to set the scene, set the mood. Um, but don't give us a blow-by-blow -blow account of what happened. That's not a review. That's just a breakdown That's of... a synopsis. A synopsis, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what a review is. Um, if you send through a piece of writing that is supposed to be a review and is essentially reporting on the show you saw and then at the very end says, I didn't think it was good, um, <laughs> you have failed as a reviewer. Um, that's like some awful Goodreads review or Amazon review. That's, that's not what I call a good review or even an insightful one. So, oh, am I talking? Uh, yeah, I just wrote down here, remember... Criticism isn't just about recommendations and warnings. So whether or not critics like what we see or witness, you know, what we care about is how it works and why it doesn't work and the context in which it was created. Um, we assume that readers are not just reading a review to buy a product or to tend a show, but they're more interested in ideas and provocations. So you think about the more... I guess more general way you can you can write a review and not just sort of focal I mean focalize on, on this one thing. Just expand your your kind of your scope, really, isn't it? It's all as I said before, and I'm gonna expand on this a bit later with, with book reviewing, but yeah, context is super important. You know, so we we know because I, I read reviews too, obviously, and half the time I never get a chance to get around to reading the book or seeing the performance, but I like reading a review. Because it keeps me abreast of the news, 
and it's it just makes me feel informed. And so your your I guess job as a reviewer is to try and be informed as possible. And one of the other key purposes of a piece of uh, critical writing, particularly in the performing arts, is that the performing arts are effectively an ephemeral art form. If you're not there, you don't know the show happened. So uh, a review acts as documentation of the work, documentation of the artist's achievements, or I hesitate to use the word failures, but flaws is a, is a better word, a kinder word. Um, so and that documentation serves, A, as something they can say, look, we made a thing, people saw it. Here is an informed, thoughtful take on what we created. Maybe, maybe they think you got it, maybe they think you didn't get it, but either way, they have proof that their 45-minute dance performance <laughs> happened and was seen, which is not only valuable for them to be able to trace their artistic development over time, when five years later they come back and reread the review of yours, which they originally hated and were offended by, and then went, oh, God, they were right. That scene didn't work. I should have cut it out. Um, so there's that value for it. But it also serves as documentation for artists to um, submit grant applications as well. Um, a, uh, a respectful, thoughtful, analytical review um, uh, when an artist is applying mm -hmm. for funding from Creative Victoria, the City of Melbourne, uh, the Australia Council, sorry, uh, Creative Australia, as they're now called, um, having a body of reviews that document their work, their process as an artist, their development as an artist, their skill as an artist is also going to be helpful. But a review also serves as marketing collateral, which is why arts organisations love stars. Critics often hate them uh, because we've written this thoughtful, analytical piece and then at the end we have to go, three and a half stars. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Sometimes that half star makes all the difference, yeah. isn't it? Um, and I once, as a result of that, I, I wrote out a, a rough guide as to what the five stars, four stars, three stars, two stars, one star, half a star meant for Arts Hub. We published it in response to a, uh, an article by... <coughs> Uh, a local choreographer saying stars are appalling, they should never have been used in reviews. Uh, and then, kind of about a, a year later, he quoted my four-star <laughs> review of a show and put the, the stars on the poster. That's so um, funny. So they are used as a marketing tool. Um, you see it constantly at the comedy festival. You walk down the street and somebody has sticky taped, kind of like five stars, kind of the age, onto their poster. Um, so... They also serve as promotional collateral for artists um, and as a guide for the general public as to whether they should spend their hard-earned money on this $85, $25, $150 show. That as, actually, as a sort of objective of writing a review, you know, you don't want to think about marketing collateral for arts companies. Yes, avoid pull quotes. <laughs> if you can. Um, I just want to quickly focus on one sort of uh, loads of people hate critics because they think we're parasites you know and I just want to like we're feeding off their precious work and to that argument I always say well you need us as much as you know we need you it's a codependent relationship and if you're a good critic you can pick up on undertones themes all sorts of observations that the original creator didn't pick up at all when they created it so, you know, the, the critic, if you're a good one, I think you do a, a, a kind of like a secondary role for them. You know, it just helps them. And sometimes I read and go, oh, wow, did I do that? I didn't, I didn't mean to. So I, I don't – obviously, they're, they're terrible critics and we don't really talk about them at the moment. But if you're a good critic, you can actually help a work, even if you're pointing out objectively how it's wrong, how it didn't work. And hopefully that would inspire them for their next creation to do a better job. So it's almost like a community service act, at least I think so. Mm. Tui, I think your mic is cutting out a little bit. Is that? Bit. Sorry, is that better? Uh, it was more that it was just dropping in and out slightly. I reckon hold that? it higher. How's that? Sorry, I'm higher? not a broadcaster, so is that better? 
Right. All right. Sorry, I'm just going to keep it at this. It's not level. that I'm trying to mansplain my. No, no, no. I, I'm not great. Given with... that we are recording and broadcasting. Yes. This. Sorry about that. How's that? I'll, I'll keep it at this level from now on. Okay. So wait, uh, one more quickly thing uh, I want to say before we talk in depth about reviewing in our particular art forms is passion. You need to have passion. There's no point writing about something you don't care about. Would you agree with that, Richard? I would. I would also uh, <coughs> add that there is no point <coughs> writing about something you already think you're going to hate. Yes. Um, uh, I don't review opera <coughs> because it just doesn't work for me as an art form. Apologies to any opera buffs in the room or listening or watching uh, this uh, at a later point. Um, I have struggled with opera. I have tried. As a result, I have decided I will not review it because I'm going into it with preconceptions that I will not like it. Those preconceptions are damaging and dangerous. Um, I try to approach every work, um, and it's one of the reasons why when I'm kind of um, pre-pandemic, I was seeing 180 shows a year, um, was because I go into every show thinking, this is going to be it. This is going to be mm -hmm. that one show of the year that I will talk about in five or ten years' time, going, remember that remarkable dance cabaret show, whatever it was. Um, so, uh, and I guess following on from that, and I, this may preempt something that Twee has in her notes, do not review work by your friends and lovers and do not review work by your enemies and rivals. Um, again, it is your job as a critic to be as objective as possible, even though what you're writing is a subjective take on an art form. Yep, and, and please tell your commissioning editor if you are related or sleeping with or have any sort of issue with the work, you know, that you are reviewing because we don't know your personal relationships and it's kind of not fair if you're reviewing someone you hated, you know, so please let us know. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly talk about book reviewing. I'm just going to – and Richard, well, we're going to break it up a bit because otherwise I'll just talk for like half an hour, which is super boring. So for those interested in book reviewing, there's a couple of notes that I wrote down. Some of, I mean, I apologise for those who have written book reviews and all of this is like, you know, you know it all by heart. But sometimes I think these things are good to be reminded of just for everyone. Actually, can we just pause there? Can we get a yeah. show of hands just to break down by art form what <coughs> people are most interested in reviewing and, uh, and writing about? So for books? Okay. Yep. Uh, visual art? Cool. Ooh, excellent. Oh, excellent. Shame Gina's yeah, not here. Gina's at the end. I've, I'll, 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 yep. Performing arts. That's a good mix. Okay, it's great. Like the... We'll have to make sure that we focus on Gina's oh, no, right. I will make to definitely make sure uh, to, to include Gina's comments at the end. All right, books. Now, this goes across all art forms, but try not to use the first personal pronoun. Don't, try not to use I. It kind of drives me nuts because we know you're writing the review. You don't have to keep on saying I, okay? When... Just try and be, just have the semblance of objectivity at least. All art forms. Every now and then I let it slip, but it kind of annoys me. Was that, would you agree with that, Richard? I would totally agree. Yeah. And <clears throat> on a related note, avoid being, uh, avoid gonzo journalism. Um, back when I used to write for the street press, which is how I started out as a reviewer, um, I would read reviews from somebody telling me about their car trip from Carlton to St Kilda and what they had for dinner and yep. kind of how they got into an argument with the bouncer and then what their friend was thinking about the support act. And I'm like, no, just review the band. No one cares. Yes, no one cares about your life story. You're here to do a job, so just concentrate on the job at hand. I know I've read lots of reviews and the more words they have to play with, the more they fiddle around with excess information which drives me insane because all you do is just edit it all out, really. It's, like, it's not important. Okay, so leave I out of it. If it's a long book, take notes. I know it sounds ridiculously simple, but people forget to do that and then they get confused. So if particularly if it's like a, a family, like a multi-generational story, you're going to forget who's related to whom. So do a family tree to jog your memory. Um, provide context. Now, this is super important. I don't care what art form you're writing about. This is what we mean. We keep on banging on about it, Rich and I and Gina, and we'll see why. So just assume the reader doesn't know anything about this work, so you have to do some research. Is this the first book? Is this the second book? Is this part of a trilogy? Is it the debut? And what's also important is also providing some sort of context. Is this, if it's a second book, 
is it different from the first one? Is this person moved from non-fiction to poetry because that's a huge leap? Or they're doing exactly the same thing just with a different title? Because a lot of authors out there basically market the same material and readers lap it up because they know exactly what they're expecting. Okay, now... Can you give us a practical example? Yeah, exactly. I wrote... Um, Sorry, I'm dropping in here, of Trent Dalton's latest book, Lola in the Mirror. And my review, basically, if I can find what I said, because I was familiar with his previous works, I knew that this book of his, his latest novel, was pretty much exactly the same. So I read in my review that, what did I say? I'm just going to read out a quote that I wrote. This novel is quintessential Dalton in that his detractors will find much to cast a withering eye over while fans will celebrate his signature style of meshing real life and fanciful imaginative flights. Now, I was being super fair because there are people who hate Trent Dalton and, and I've read horrible reviews of him and I don't think that's fair because there's also people who love his work. So my review, I try to be as balanced as possible and say, look, if you love his work, this book will give you exactly what you love and if you hate him, don't read this book. It's not like, oh, you know, I'm not going to spend 600 words saying this book is terrible, which I have read reviews about that, and I just don't think it's fair. He has won, well, he hasn't won many awards at all, but he's not that, he never set out to win awards. He's not a literary, literary writer. He's a popular fiction writer, and he sold millions, millions of copies. So, you know, he has a little bit of credit for that. I think that's what I mean. I'm going to stop for a bit and let Richard talk about performance arts before I carry on. So. Sure. Um, I want to use some um, practical examples of things that I look for when I'm looking at work. Um, because one of my frustrations when I read uh, kind of reviews by kind of newer writers, um, I'm not going to say younger because people start writing at all sorts of different ages. Um, uh, if I'm reading a review of a dance work, I get frustrated when they don't actually describe the dance. They don't talk mm -hmm. about the, the, the movement vocabulary. They kind of talk about the tone or the feel of the show. But if I'm reading a dance review, I want to know about the, the style of dance that I am seeing um, or that I, will, I might see if I go and, and see this work. So is the performer kind of deeply grounded uh, to the floor? Are they dancing barefoot um, uh, and kind of... Talk, tell me about the, the gestures of their arms. Are they using a, a more balletic style of kind of, of uh, very kind of posed, straight, angular lines? Um, if it's contemporary dance, um, uh, are they ad adapting uh, the vocabulary of other dance forms? Is, are they referencing hip hop? Are they referencing circus in the movement? Thinking about those kind of details, um, I think make for a, a a deeper, more insightful and more valuable review. And one of the reasons I mentioned contemporary dance is I used to keep a blog years ago, pre, in the pre-Facebook days. Um, there was a point you know, when all of my friends had blogs. Um, I had one too. Uh, and I went, I was taken by a friend to see a Chunky Move performance. And I got home from it and wrote, I don't understand contemporary dance. I can't read mm -hmm. it the way I can read a play. Kind of, I struggle with it intellectually. Uh, mm -hmm. And now... I have read such great dance criticism over the years, interviewed a lot of dancers about their work, seen a lot of contemporary dance, that contemporary dance is now one of my favourite art forms. Um, so don't be afraid to, to as a, in your journey as a, as a writer and as a, as a critic, to explore and investigate gaps in your um, kind of artistic uh, kind of experience. Um, maybe don't submit a published review of the latest, um, I don't know, uh, Australian ballet show if you've never reviewed ballet before. But um, those kind of details for dance are really important. I mentioned earlier the idea of what works and what doesn't work, what jars about a work in terms of sound design. That's another. Um, in terms of performance, um, is one of the actors acting in a completely different style and mode to everybody else kind of on stage? 
And if so, does that mean that the director hasn't been able to rein them in properly, that they have a prima donna on their hands? Thinking about those kind of details, I wouldn't necessarily say that in the review, but it would be something that I would be thinking. Like Twee, I also recommend taking notes, um, not with uh, a laptop or an iPad, pad as I have seen people doing in comedy shows, um, mm. sitting in the front row with a laptop lit up, oh. typing away and the comedian just getting thrown and looking at them. But I carry a little notebook like this around. Um, I scribble down key lines of dialogue, mm -hmm. uh, particular impressions that I get from a work uh, and then hoping the next day that I can read my written in the dark while not looking at the notepad writing. Um, I try to decipher that and those few words and phrases I've jotted down act as memory triggers when it comes to the review itself. And uh, the other thing I will look for, because uh, I think it's important to acknowledge and to honour all aspects of a work, are things like set design, costume design and lighting design. They're just as crucial as the, the script, the performances, uh, everything else. Um, to give a, uh, an example from uh, one of my own reviews, several years ago I went to an Adelaide Festival work called The Doctor, which I knew was uh, a provocative take on um, who has the right to tell which stories, um, uh, about political correctness, about moral panic and, and many other things. I knew it was going to be a slightly kind of adversarial play uh, with, in terms of the two lead characters. I sit down in my seat, the, the curtains are open, the stage is bare. The first thing I notice is the back wall of the set is semicircular and sloping slightly like the walls of a coliseum. Um, the stage design is literally telling us we are going to see gladiatorial combat but with words uh, and politics, not with swords. Um, the same production used a, result, uh, a revolve um, and I've seen plenty of shows where a revolve is almost gratuitous and it's just, look, we've got somebody running on the spot, on the revolve, how exciting. And it's kind of like, you didn't need to do that. But in this instance, the revolve was used just ever so slightly to slowly shift the position of the characters so that one moment you're looking at one side of them, the next moment you're looking at them from the other side. Again, the, des the design, and in that case, this is a directorial choice, is literally embodying you and showing you the shifting ground beneath these characters' feet, uh, the way that in an argument, uh, if it's a convincing argument, you may actually change your point of view. Um, sadly, the internet has reduced our ability to do that. Um, but you know, it was a beautiful piece of, of uh, kind of direction coupled with great design and an amazing script. So. Think about those things when you're looking at a work. What do they tell you about the work? How do they add to it? How do they detract from it? Yeah, and, and I think as Richard says, be specific and expansive at the same time. For book reviews in particular, if the reviewer is doing a good job, you basically be able to figure out the tone, the characterization, the narrative, the language, whether or not it succeeds as a particular example of its genre, which uh, kind of leads me to say, I mean, Try, if you can, to identify if it fits into a genre or, or, it, or it's some sort of a mesh and review it within its genre. What I mean by that is if you hate chick lit and you're reviewing a chick lit and you just say, God, this is terrible, that's sort of your ignorance because other people who love chick lit will think that's amazing. That's, that's like the most fantastic of its genre. So, you know, just review fairly. Sometimes your bias can show, as Richard says, he hates opera, so he's always just, or doesn't, well, he doesn't hate opera, he just doesn't I, review it, opera. It so just he's doesn't, not, yeah. like, I've sat next <clears> to <throat> people who've been weeping, <laughs> and I cry at the drop of a hat. Like, I cry at some bloody TV commercials, um, and I'm going, curse you, you emotional manipulation, but I'm still weeping. I cry so easily at the theatre, and I sit through these, what are supposed to be deeply moving, powerful operas, and I with no emotional response. I just don't get it. So I don't hate it. I just, yeah. it's not for me. It's not for you. Um, space Can permitting, if you can, quote from the a couple of lines from the book to support your argument, particularly if, you know, if, if the language, if, if, if you're going to write a negative review, maybe show in a couple of lines why the language is terrible or just full of cliches or trite or whatever. 
this is like space permitting. Um, and similarly with performance writing, if mm. you were writing about a play, um, you can sometimes often contact the publicist or the, the marketing department at the company and say, is it possible for me to access a copy of the script so that I can make sure that if I am quoting lines of dialogue, I'm not quoting them from my scribbled notes or from memory, um, but I am getting those quotes accurate and right. Um, and I found sometimes it can be enormously rewarding after seeing a show to then read the script and compare the playwright's vision on the page to what I've just seen in the theatre. Um, sometimes um, that... I know other critics who don't do that. They would su suggest that that will interfere with your, your own critical perspective and your own personal take because you're starting to become informed rather than by what you saw but by what you're reading. Um, but you will find what works for you. And the other thing that I wanted to say, which literally just sprang into my head as, in, as I was saying, talking, uh, using that last sentence, words, how do they work? Um, review what you are seeing, not what you hoped to see. It is not a work's fault if you think I was going to see a, a rip-roaring comedy and instead I got a distressing Greek tragedy maybe you should have done your homework. Um, uh, but, because I have read reviews where um, where uh, critics have written, this would have been a much better play if this had happened and that had happened. And it's like, well, that's what you wanted to happen. Tell us what did happen and why you didn't like that aspect of it. Because, um, yeah, I think kind of reviewers can sometimes fall into a trap of writing about being disappointed about what they got because it didn't match up to their expectations of what they were going to see. Oh, true. Uh, I think I just want to talk about being specific. When I said before, it's like I think being specific is most useful to readers and that's what I mean by that is like you just take a bit of time to highlight particular instances in the book or the work um, to su support your evaluation. Don't make sweeping statements without backing it up. Okay, yeah. and also another thing, spoilers. I have had to edit so many spoilers from book reviews and this is part of your do not tell everything, particularly if it's something distressing. You know, don't tell me the baby died in chapter three. You, it's your skill set as a writer to write around that and say something like in chapter three something traumatic happens which ultimately changed the course of their life. You don't have to be specific because if you're reading this for the first time, you're like, well, why'd you tell me that? Now you just bought up, you know, it's people do this all the time and it drives me nuts. I don't, and sometimes you can get away with it if it's universally known and they sort of tout it all over the blurb, which they really shouldn't, or the back end of the book. But usually I just, just keep it general. Mm. Um, and I guess in terms of spoilers, and this applies specific, particularly to scripted theatre, for example. Um, I think it's generally fine to talk about what happens in the first third of the work and then anything after that kind of... It's like, um, I don't know, if you are thinking about watching a new TV show and a friend says, oh, there's a fantastic twist at the end of the first episode. You won't believe what happens. Kind of, even though they don't tell you what happens, they've told you there's yeah. a fantastic twist, um, which ruins the surprise of what the, the, the screenwriter and the director had kind of wanted you to feel at the end of that first episode, so... Yeah, just be very careful with things like twists at the end and deaths happening. Yeah. Anything major that derails the, you know, the narrative. Yeah. Um, I, one example where it is possible in theatre is if it's a classic being kind of uh, restaged in some way. So, um, I don't know, if it's um, a production of Oliver Twist. Um, uh, if anybody who's seen... I'm, I'm going to drop a spoiler now for anybody mm -hmm. who's never seen a film or a stage production or read the Dickens novel. One of the main characters dies. Um, uh, and it's a brutal and tragic death. Now, you could, in a review of a production, say the death of... I forgot. Nancy. Nancy. Um, Nancy's death at the hands of the monstrous Bill Sykes felt um, contrived, lacking in... Uh, poorly choreographed, lacking in any dramatic tension. Um, 
I once saw a production of Romeo and Juliet. I will not name the company in question. Um, <laughs> at interval, uh, and luckily I wasn't reviewing it. Um, I just got some comp tickets. Um, at interval, my friend and I said, it's terrible, isn't it? Shall we stay for another 15 minutes? Because if they get the death of Mercutio wrong, <laughs> we can just go. And it was... 15 minutes in, we walked out because that scene was so poorly staged and handled. Um, uh, it should be this pivotal moment that that spurs on rage and uh, and instead it was just flat. And as we left, I saw the publicist on the other side of the foyer staring at us. Um. And I got an email the next day saying, why didn't you stay until mm. the end? And I said, well, I'm not reviewing it. Um, you don't want me to review it. Um, thank you. I hope the opening night party was lovely. Yes, but I just want to point out that that's fairly rare to have a really, really strong hatred of a show. Most critics don't walk in and think, oh, God, I'm going to hate it. You just go in hoping for the best. Mm. And it's the same with a, any book or an exhibition, you hope for the best. And for the most, I think, in my career, and I've been writing reviews for 25 years, I've tried to be as balanced as possible. And what I mean by that is even if, for example, you have to think... Did the writer do anything well? Even if you hate certain aspects of the book because, oh, gosh, the characters are wooden, it just doesn't ring true, what did they do well? Mm. You know, you try, try and be as fair as possible because usually a book isn't completely worthless. There's going to be something there that is salvageable that you could write about just, just for fairness, I think. Um, you know, and maybe the, the descriptions of the natural environment were really good. Or Something they're, like or that. Or they're world building in a the fantasy novel. The world building, novel. yes, um, exactly. The, uh, the, the story might be kind of rote um, mm -hmm. with two-dimensional characters clearly uh, ripped off from, I don't know, The Lord of the Rings or something like that. Mm, the sort of Shannara suddenly springs to mind. Um, but if the world building is convincing... That is something to single out. And the same goes for performance writing as well. Um, one, I think it's important to remember, and I made this mistake when I was a much younger critic, um, uh, that people have feelings. And if you are too scathing, they will remember you. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of, I have had a director come up to me. I went up to him, actually, at an opening night party um, uh, and said, congratulations on tonight's musical. I thought it was beautifully performed. What are you working on next? And he said, I'm taking that show you hated to New York <laughs> and turned his back and walk away. Um, and I remember the review. I wrote it on my blog. It was a piece of personal writing. It wasn't... <laughs> a critical response to a work. It was me, it was literally t entitled something like a rant about why I hated. Um, uh, but I didn't hold back because it was a piece of personal writing. It was not meant for publication except for the handful of people who read my blog. But I had forgotten that my blog had been listed in the back of the Malthouse subscription guide program as a blog to go to to read theatre reviews. Um, and unfortunately, it got seen by all of the cast and the director and... Um, I, I felt bad afterwards because I was vitriolic. And as Twee says, kind of, don't be vitriolic. Um, uh, you can be critical of a work. Don't well, be smarmy. Yeah. Try not to... I mean, I think I've written three super negative reviews in my entire life. And they deserved it. Mm. Out of, like, the hundreds that I've written, they will have been super, like, fair and balanced. So don't be nasty just because you can. Because yeah. I think Critics think we, we enjoy writing we bad don't. reviews. And, yeah, we don't. It's, um, it's, it's actually kind of... It's the hardest thing to write is a mediocre show. Um, great shows and bad shows, you can single things out. But I, I agonise over writing bad reviews because people have poured their... their their hearts into these works and then I come along and say oh, this amateur performances and clunkily directed and whatever but um, yeah so don't be vitriolic but at the same time to balance that out don't be afraid to actually be critical. That's your um, job critique. Yeah so um, I have had kind of writers contact me when I was the reviews editor at Arts Hub yep. um, uh, they would email me and say oh, they would file their review and say, by the way, I really hated it. And I, I would read their review and go, well, there's no evidence of that. What didn't you like about it? They would tell me and I would say, right, put that in the review. Put those details in. So balanced 
a balanced criticism, not vitriol and venom. Um, is, I think, one of the key responsibilities of a critic when, when kind of being negative. And we, we've talked about kind of what is a good <coughs> review or a bad review. Um, a good or a bad review is not something that says this is a good show or a bad show. It's a review that informs you, is instructive, enlightening and all of those things. And just to bounce off Richard, scathing reviews are kind of awful but sometimes fun to read. But also be careful of wholly positive reviews. I sometimes have to, and I have to do this more during Arts Hub, there are too many writers who are super positive about a show or book that really shouldn't have received that many stars or that much acclaim, but they're scared and they want to do a, a good job. Particularly when you're starting out, you're kind of scared to, to actually have a voice and you go, well, it was kind of great. And you think, really, it wasn't that great. Why are you giving it four stars for a production which was kind of average? Mm. Yeah, don't gush. Um, Try not to gush. Yeah. Because yeah. it's also not fantastic. Because we're almost running out of time, I'm going to... We've got about, I think, six minutes. We're mm. going to quickly read out Gina's comments. Remember, she is the visual arts editor and she gave me a couple of... Um, sorry, I've got a croaky voice. Um, points and what to write a visual arts review. Richard, do you want to read them out? Sure. Um, and uh, I was going to say, have you ever written visual art reviews? Once or twice, but it's not my forte. Yeah, it's not my forte either. I've also written some once or twice, mainly because I've been interstate at a festival and Gina has texted me and said, there's a great show on at such and such a gallery. Could you please cover it while you're in town? Um, hold on. I'm, uh, I've just put my glasses on. The joy's of middle age. So, notes from Gina Fairley, our visual arts editor. A visual arts review is not about the scathing scalpels of quote-unquote art criticism. It is about looking at art with context. As a visual arts writer, you need to place what you are seeing within a broader context of making. That is, not just making in our times and its triggers, it might be about the legacy of art history the trends in a medium or material, or in the context of the artist's own oeuvre. Making is never done in isolation, so you need to understand that context and how it plays into what you're looking at. When reviewing an exhibition, you need to consider the visitor experience. Exhibition design today increasingly plays a role, and some might even argue too much of a role. You need to consider flow of the exhibition, the display furniture, wall colour, lighting. How do these things sit in relation to the artworks and how do they expand or compromise uh, the viewing experience? Further to that, you want to consider not only how the artworks look in the space, but how the hang makes sense. Is it chronological in its display? What are the light... Uh, what are the... What are the lights between artworks and spaces? I'm wondering if that is supposed to be what are the links between artworks and spaces, but... Could lights. be lights. Yep. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, that makes sense as well. Yep. Um, what is the emphasis on didactics and information in the room? When you are reviewing an exhibition, you are not only reviewing the work of the artist, but the visitor experience and the narrative the curator has created around it. And a tip... And this applies to all art forms, all not art just the forms. visual arts. Don't get caught up in art speak. We often moan about art language, and thanks to our education system, artists have been pummeled into crafting artist statements that are uncomfortable to write and uncomfortable to read. Trust your experience of what you're looking at and write frankly about it. Don't get caught up in eddies of art theory or wankerisms. My feeling is if people are especially interested, they will delve deeper themselves into an artist's work. What your role is, is to open the door to their curiosity and walk them through it. And that was from Gina. So, yeah, yeah, I just want to add quickly, remember your audience. And I have edited many a review that don't seem to know who the Arts Hub audience is. You know, and what I mean by that is like some of the reviews are very academic in tone, very esoteric, very sort of like, yeah, wankerism. It's like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. If I don't know what you're talking about and I have to like link to five different Wikipedia of some specialised word, then that's not really for a general audience. And Arts Hub's audience is fairly general, you know. But 
Also, interestingly, Arts Hub's audience is uh, we our last kind of major reader survey. Um, a lot of people who are interested in the arts but don't work in the sector read Arts Hub, and a lot of people who work in the sector are practicing visual artists, actors, designers themselves read it as well because. Uh, our news keeps them up to date with what's happening around the rest of the country. Um, but uh, regardless of which of those different audiences you are writing for, including students, yeah, avoid art jargon, or I, I call it art wank, um, <laughs> uh, because it's just, it, it's dense, it's often impenetrable, um, and it's unnecessary. Good criticism is good journalism. Good journalism is clear communication. Um, if somebody has to, as Twee said, read a Wikipedia page to understand one particular word that uh, somebody has used in their review, that, to me, says that word is unnecessary. What can we replace it with? See, I don't mind one word, but if the whole review is listed with, like, five words that you have to look up, then I think that's overkill. So I really, yeah, you just try and... And some, I don't know... Try and write, this sounds ridiculous, but small sentences can sometimes help. I find a lot of people try to show off so much and write really dense prose that there's no commas, there's no full stuff. It just goes on and on. Just just break up your prose. Yeah, and because particularly if you're writing for an online audience, yes. people read differently online. So short, punchy sentences, not long, flowing sentences and, uh, and long paragraphs are easier to read. People will actually read them, not just skim the page. The other thing um, that uh, and we're about to go to questions from the audience, but um, the other thing I wanted to add is don't be precious about being edited. Mm -hmm. It's only the bad writers I've worked with over the years who get really kind of angry and contact you to say, but you've kind of chopped out kind of like three sentences in the first paragraph. And oh, I was like, that is so true. Yeah. Um, and it's because they were clunky, awkward, unnecessary pieces of exposition um, rather than contributing to the, to the point of the review. Um, good writers go, oh, the editor has improved my piece by making these cuts, slightly rearranging the text so that it now flows better, it reads better. Oh, I'm so happy that they've made those changes. So, yeah, just don't be precious about your work. Um, the arts industry is small. The arts journalism uh, industry is even smaller. If you get a reputation for being precious, people will not commission you. This is actually true. And a while ago, when I first started Arts Hub, a reviewer who wasn't very good had a go at me because I changed a semicolon to a dash or something ridiculous like that. She actually just emailed me about it and I was like, what? And she said, I don't normally use semicolons. And I was stunned. I was stunned into silence. <laughs> and I was like, what? You know, you're, you're being edited. This is part of the editorial process. Everybody's work gets edited. Even my own gets edited. And you're having a go at me because I changed your punctuation. And you know what? I never used it again. She was in my little black book of reviewers. <laughs> they were really problematic to use. Yeah. So, really, you could be... There's a couple of things that I look for as a reviewer. It's be punctual. So, if there's a deadline, please, please make it. I'm forever chasing... Unless you have a really good reason... You know, please, please, please make deadline because it just makes it hard for us if we're trying to fill the page or you know we're getting harassed by by publicists. So yes, be punctual. Yeah, as Richard says, do not be precious about your work being edited because everybody's work. That said, edited. I will just add um, uh, <laughs> the only time I think it is value it is worth being precious is if somebody has completely written your work, rewritten your re work yeah. without consulting you. In my very, very, very early days as an editor at a, uh, a, the, a, a now defunct gay and lesbian newspaper, um, uh, defunct because Grinder came along and suddenly nobody needed to take out advertising, um, um, I kind of was on deadline, I was stressed, I was panicking, I rewrote 50% of somebody's article to add what I thought was the information that needed. The writer saw it, was offended and understandably pissed off. So um, editors can make mistakes, um, but try to maintain a healthy relationship with your editor. On that note, should we go to questions? Yeah, we, we try and... I try and edit as lightly as I can. I try and keep the, the, the writer's tone 
but some, um, and usually we're editing for clarity. If anyone's editing, we try not to change too much. We usually we kind of cut down extraneous sentences or words, but we don't. We try not to just change the meaning entirely. So, yeah, so we'll break it up to question time. Can anyone have anything to say? Do we have a roaming mic or no? In which case, I will run around on the floor. Oh, no. Sel yeah, no, Selena. Selena yeah. can run around the floor. Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Tui. My question is, um, would you both have an example of a um, something in a good review that has stuck with you or that you think that makes a good review, like maybe two or three things that you look for in a good review. Um, and the other question was um, the same for a bad review. Like you look at it and you say, mm, this, is not, this is not what we want to publish. Oh, Richard, you want to? Oh, sorry. Um, not necessarily. I may not be able to think of three examples for each, but yeah. um, uh, for me, yes. If if I am gripped by the opening sentence, um, uh, that to me says this writer knows what they're doing. I want to keep reading then and see where this goes. Now it's like writing a short story. Mm. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So that's that's one example. Um, a review that makes me feel like I've seen the work without having seen it, that has informed me in a way about a particular artist's style, regardless of the art form they're working in, um, that has given me such a rich, evocative, sensory impression of the work, to me, is a good review. Yeah, I agree. I mean, as I said before, try not to be boring. Try and just don't use clichés. Try and keep me interested. It's, it's still a piece of work, you know, still an art form, it's a piece of writing, delight me, surprise me. It, I've read so many reviews that are just sort of like, I saw the show or I read the book, here's a review, it's just so plodden and, and, and kind of boring and dull. I think the most reviews that I really like, and we have a couple of really wonderful reviewers on Arts Hub, you should check out their work, which I'll mention a bit later who they are, if you want to talk to me afterwards. They always surprise me because they bring in context that I don't know about and I don't have to sit there working out what's going on. And I read a lot of it. Obviously, like, we commission reviews across the country and I can't see all these shows because they're in Perth or in Adelaide and whatever else. But if I read a review and it makes me feel like I was there at the show and I know what the lighting was doing and you know, how, how the, uh, the music sounded or if someone reads or writes a book review and I go, wow, that sounds amazing. I want to read the book now. See, that's, that's, a, that's an easy sell, isn't it? Or, gosh, I'm going to avoid that. It, it just, it, it just, I think I'm a quite emotion-driven, so anything that sort of drives a bit of passion in me, either for or against, I'm excited by. Yeah, but the hardest thing is like a, a, a review that just goes nowhere. It's sort of, because it's so boring, it's on the fence that you kind of don't know what to say. You know, or what the reviewer is saying, or what the reviewer is saying. It's like, uh, do you? What, what's the actual opinion on this? Because it's just sort of, yeah. Bleh. Yeah. yeah. So that that namby pambiness, yeah, um, uh, or lack of focus would, for me, be one of the signs of a bad mm. review. Um, something that, as we mentioned earlier, is essentially, um, and this is something that the Herald Sun has has been guilty of in the past, um, uh, because. And I'm not blaming the writers because the Herald Sun used to have a, a, a media deal with uh, the Melbourne International Comedy Festival and said that they would review, I don't know, 50 to 60 to 80 percent of the shows in the festival, which meant they were sending oh. the economics reporter along to review comedy uh, oh. or the um, social pages photographer to review <laughs> shows. So you were getting reviews um, like, I think somebody gave Wogs out of work five stars and then gave Hannah Gadsby the next day one star. Um, and I was just thinking, you don't really know comedy as an art form. So, yeah, for me, a bad re the sign of a bad review is that is a lack of experience, a lack of consideration for the, the rules and the structure and the form of the work that they are reviewing. And sorry to single out the Herald Sun. Um, uh, as I said, I... I I've named the name of the newspaper, but I won't name the reviewers. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Sorry, we kind of answered your question, but yeah. Anyone? No, if nobody wants to, 
wants to ask a question in public, you can come and talk to us uh, afterwards. We'll hang around for a little bit. Um, Do you have any final words, Richard, that you think we haven't covered? I think we sort of bounced around a bit, didn't we? Yeah, sure, oh. please. Um, you mentioned something around subjectivity and being factual. And I wonder, you know, passion is a subjective thing. And often, you know, when we say loud, loud, it might be a subjective thing for a particular art form to be loud. So I suppose the question is, what is that kind of balance between subjectivity and being factual, that you want to present what you felt? Because, of course, it is a personal, almost a personal piece of writing, but it's also journalistic. So. You have to tell me why. That, that's, that's, that's the balance. If you think this was too loud or not loud enough or grating or jarring or problematic or whatever else, this is what I mean by providing examples. I just don't like when people offer a review and they just kind of make bold statements without backing it up. You remember? You have to remember we went there. Rich and I went there. When we're reading a review, we don't know what you're talking about. You have to tell us why. And also it comes – and this comes with every other art form. Why was this book terrible or why was it great? Show me. You actually have to show me. So you have to – as we said right at the beginning, a review is a persuasive piece of writing. Do you remember right when you were in high school and you were asked to write – pros or for against euthanasia or capital punishment and all that. A review is a bit like that. You have to convince me that your opinion or and your against your coverage of, of a show or book or an exhibition is a good one. And if you and if you you know if you're not convincing it just means that you haven't shown me enough examples. You're just being kind of wishy washy. And I can give two examples specific, specifically about that example of loud. Um, uh, in a performance piece, if the sound design is so loud that you can't hear the dialogue, if you can't hear the actors, then that to me is a sign that the sound mixer has done, or the sound yeah. designer has done a poor job. Um, the flip side of that was at, I went to Illuminate Adelaide earlier this year and uh, had the great joy of attending um, Unsound, which is a uh, two nights of experimental music. Um, and some of that was really fucking loud, <laughs> but it's meant to be. Um, you're meant to feel it in your body and your bones. It's supposed to kind of like pump through you. Um, so, yes, I was wearing kind of like – I kind of had those little kind of uh, earplugs in because um, uh, I don't want to develop tinnitus. Um, but uh, I could appreciate – I was watching people shuddering – kind of with joy uh, as the music kind of pumped through them. Um, um, in particular, say, the uh, performance by Robin Fox, who's a uh, local composer but also kind of light, does lighting and he did the, the drum uh, composition for Stephanie Lake's Colossus that was recently on here at Art Centre Melbourne. Um, uh, so, yeah, kind of – and also at, at Unsound I got to see stuff which was not to my personal taste – but again, um, uh, take yourself out of your own thoughts sometimes and go, how are the rest of the audience responding to this? If I've been, for example, the only person in a comedy show not laughing, um, and that's a that comes down to taste. That's a matter of personal taste, um, which makes it a challenge to review. So in which case you, you talk about the structure of the show, um, the originality of the jokes um, without – giving away punchlines, never give away punchlines if you're reviewing comedy. Um, and you talk about the joy and the response from the audience. Um, you you leave your own, oh, God, this is <laughs> so not my thing. You leave that out. Yeah. With, the, I mean, with sound, obviously, if you're reviewing theatre and you can't hear what the cast are saying, that is obviously a sound issue and that should be mentioned. Um, maybe on opening night they still haven't sort of fixed it properly and that's just... That's another thing you have to watch out for. But it's opening night. You don't really have a choice. If yeah, you, you know. and you can mention that in your review. Yeah. If kind of cast mm -hmm. members are coming on and their mics haven't been... Like yeah. You'll notice that kind of in larger theatres, actors will have those little kind of like mics dangling at the front of their forehead. Um, uh, and, yeah, the, the tech may not be quite up to speed yet because it's opening night. It's they've opening had night. They've had five rehearsals. Um, but you can still mention in your review, mm -hmm. despite some opening night glitches, yeah, uh, X, exactly. Y and Z. Just mention, yeah, despite opening night glitches, the show went on 
you know, really well afterwards and hopefully the uh, sound issues will be resolved in later productions, something like that. <laughs> so you acknowledge the fact that there were sound issues but you don't just demonise them over it because obviously they're still settling down. Yeah. So that's being like fair, that's why that's gets being fair. Um, anyone else have any questions while we try and wrap it up? Yeah, Rich and I will be hanging around here for a bit Wait, longer. So. We have a question oh, down the front. Yes. I was just wondering, um, with everything getting faster and faster in news cycles and things like that, um, do you have to re uh, write the reviews quicker than you used to or is there a yes, specific time we, period? Yes, but Rich and I, I think we, because we've done this for so long, part of the skill set is learning to write quickly because Arts Hub, you know, is a daily publication. We don't really have... Particularly with, with theatre, um, I've often... And Rich has done it too. If something opens at the MTC on Wednesday night and I see the show, I aim to review it the following day. So it will be on our website. We don't, we don't really have the luxury of waiting a week or whatever. It's the sooner the better. Yeah, um, that's particularly true if you're reviewing work at a festival, for example, because um, a show, a performance, dance, theatre, um, whatever it is, may only have three performances, so you need yeah. to get a review up quickly. But the, the, the mm -hmm. flip side of that is that publishing has changed to a degree. Um, uh, Twee and I have colleagues who used to have to phone in their review from opening night and dictate it to somebody at the news desk. Um, I did that. I'm that old. I remember yeah. doing that yeah. years ago. Having um, I did that, in, you know, intermission. Yeah. So because yeah. of online publishing, mm -hmm. that has now changed because it means that the review still gets published the next day. Like if you're reviewing for The Age, the Age arts editor will say, file your review by 10 o'clock in the morning at the latest. Yeah. It then appears in the print edition the next day if they have room for arts coverage in the paper, which they often don't anymore, but it's still online mm. and can be read and accessed and uh, uh, your five stars, tremendous, can be used on the company's website. So, uh, Or, as what happened to a, a, uh, a critical colleague recently, um, he reviewed a show and he, he basically said the whole thing was banal and boring, but he said one thing about... He said, but the sound design was exquisite. Said theatre company, pull quote, exquisite! Yeah, that was very cheeky and quite morally wrong, basically, but that did it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. We should probably, we should probably wrap up. Um, thank you so much for your time and for listening and nodding and jotting down some notes. Yes. We hope it was valuable. Yes, uh, Rich and I could be here forever, but, yeah, it's a topic that, we're, as you can tell, we're very passionate about. So hopefully you have some ideas and pointers and refreshes. So, yeah, we'll be here for a couple of minutes or at least afterwards, ten minutes, if you want to talk to us. Otherwise, we're scooting off. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for the channel. And out.